college knowing most of what we generally pride ourselves on helping our students learn, namely that if you're not really learning for yourself, you're not learning, and that if you're taking something on authority, you're not learning either. Um, and I think she's, uh, she teaches in the psychology department at the University of Chicago, and I won't say a lot more about her various studies and achievements because I think you'll find out uh, practically about them. But I will say that I am proud to um, be able to claim even a tiny bit of credit for uh, a graduate who not only got a job, but got a great job <laughs> <laughs> and uh, continued all through her career to, uh, to look for a real learning and, um, and found some. <laughs> so uh, I uh, ask you to welcome Ms. Leslie Kay. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I, have, I have to say that we were, uh, or Mr. Stickman, that we were, uh, we subjected to him to trial by fire. And uh, we're not the most well-behaved uh, freshman class. We still are not, as you can hear from back there. Um, so first I want to just thank you all for inviting me here. I've given talks all over the world and all over the country, and this is really sort of the coolest thing I've ever done, so thank you. <laughs> um, and I also, so besides thanking you all, I want to thank the people who really do all the work. Um, and these are, our, these are the people, graduate students and postdoc currently in my lab, and these are former graduate students and postdocs. And I've listed here a large number of undergraduates who have helped out uh, in my lab uh, throughout the years and done research on their own. At the University of Chicago, we have some fabulous undergraduate researchers. But I also want to point out all these people you see in bold are St. John's students. And the underlined ones are St. John's Santa Fe. So I think we have some catching up to do on Santa Fe. Um, and UG uh, started in my lab as a sort of um, post bac uh, casual researcher and has now just started in the graduate program uh, this year in, the, in our PhD program. So um, Carrie said that, that I um, challenged things a lot. I don't actually remember that incident, but I'm sure it probably happened. <laughs> um, but most of my career has been founded in challenging assumptions. So I'm going to just start right with David Hume. Um, David Hume challenges us in his treatise of human nature with the idea that we cannot know the objective source of our sensory knowledge. As to those impressions which arise from the senses, their ultimate cause is, in my opinion, perfectly inexplicable by human reason, and will always be impossible to decide with certainty whether they arise immediately from the object or are produced by the creative power of the mind or are derived from the author of our being. And I remember reading this as a junior, and it struck me, and I remember a very long seminar in which we tried to figure out if the crumpled up piece of paper under the bush was actually a crumpled up piece of paper under the bush or was a rabbit. How would we know? And so my career has pretty much been based on that conversation. Um, so tonight I will discuss how this view is completely correct and also incorrect. We can answer Hume's uncertainty in the validity of our perceptions, but in the process I will redefine what I mean by certainty in sensory perception. And um, we will end with a certainty that depends on imprecision, driven by the stability of physical laws, but subject to the instability of personal experience and variance. The certainty that emerges 
is one based in dynamics and emergent processes. And it tells us that we must expand our expectations in seeking how brains help us to interpret the world around us. So contrary to Hume's and many other philosophies, uncertainty about our knowledge of the physical world, much of sensory neuroscience is directed at finding out how brains, and more specifically, how neurons or brain cells represent the external stimuli that an individual encounters in the world. This is referred to as the neural code for something. For example, if a number of neurons respond to a particular visual feature by changing their firing rates, then we say that these neurons in primary visual cortex encode this feature. The mode by which they encode it can be of a number of different types, but as neuroscientists, our experiments are often designed to find these stable representations as a first step toward understanding how information from the sensory world then gets transformed at various levels of a system and finally into behavior. I study olfaction, sense of smell. And there's a certain beauty to studying this that is rooted in my St. John's education, which taught me to avoid assumptions when approaching the unknown. I study sensory neurophysiology, which means the physiology of the brain, and psychophysics, which means the quantitative measurement of perception. I do this with few assumptions about what I should find, and that has led me to some very interesting and surprising discoveries. So let me explain this freedom from assumptions. Humans are visual and auditory animals. This means that we rely on these senses to find our way in and understand the world. Our cognitive structures are born in a sea of images and sounds. We cannot help but look for how our brains represent the features that we think they should, rather than the features that they do represent. This cognitive foundation also lives in a very low dimensional world. Here you see the uh, sensory information from a tree, right, coming into the retina, making an upside down image on that uh, parabolic, due to the parabolic lens, and then uh, being transmitted through various stages up through visual cortex where the tree is reconstructed. Um, in the human retina, in here, there are typically three kinds of color receptors or cones plus rods which are sensitive to changes in light and dark. The visual pathway maps this two-dimensional sensory image from the retina onto cortex, meaning that nearby points in cortex respond to light on the retina from nearby points in space. This is called retinotopy. We infer the rest of what is going on in visual space by combining the information from our two eyes and our visual experience. As neuroscientists, we typically assume and teach our students that more complex functions are accomplished hierarchi hierarchically at higher and higher levels of the system until finally a decision is made and a behavior is started. The assumption is that this, that this is mostly objective sensory information in the visual scene. Edges, colors, and spatial relationships, and meaning is attached later in what are called, our, or what are called higher order sensory areas. What fuels this view is the hidden assumption that we know what visual primitives are, and we find them there. This, of course, is circular. We don't look for other types of rest representations because we don't know what we would look for. What if we turn the search on its head and imagine we don't know what the primitives are? Take the case of olfaction. We might naively think that molecules are the primitives. To understand why this is wrong, I need to tell you a little bit about odor receptors and how the receptor neurons in the nose map into the brain. Neurons in the sensory epithelium deep in your nasal cavity and in that of rats, mice, monkeys, elephants, fish, and on the antenna of insects and lobsters and slugs express receptors, express odor receptors that bind odor molecules. We're a little behind research on the retina because the genes for odor receptors 
were only discovered in the early 1990s after many decades of research on the olfactory system. Lisa, uh, Linda Buck was a postdoc in Richard Axel's lab and together they won the Nobel Prize for this work um, in 2004. The olfactory story is very complex. Instead of four types of light receptors expressed in the retina, a handful of different types of pressure and temperature sensors in the skin, and a few types of taste receptors on the tongue. In the nasal sensory epithelium, there are about 1,200 different odor receptor types in rats, about 400 in humans, and in African elephants, a whopping 2,000. Each sensory neuron expresses a single type of receptor. Humans have about 40 million receptor neurons in the sensory epithelium. You know, a couple of square centimeters of tissue right up inside your nose. Um, and receptor expression is distributed relatively randomly throughout the epithelium. While only a handful of receptors have been well characterized, about 10 in mice. The consensus is that each of those receptors is sensitive to a par particular molecular feature in the context of a range of other molecular properties. This means that each type of molecule will bind to a few different types of receptors with different strengths, depending on molecular features, and each receptor type will be sensitive to many different types of molecules. The widely distributed receptor neurons in the epithelium that express a given receptor type then collect their axons or processes, which carry signals to other neurons and project to identified places in the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb, if you stick your finger in your nose and push really hard and break through the skull, you'll hit the olfactory bulb. <laughs> Don't try this. Okay? Here's an olfactory bulb, or here's a side view of a rat head. And this is the nasal cavity with the sensory epithelium up here. And here's the olfactory bulb and the rest of the brain. If you take it out, you can see the olfactory bulb occupies quite a lot of territory in a rat. In humans, it's just this tiny yellow part um, situated on the base of the brain over the nose. And the olfactory receptors in humans, as I said, are up inside the nose and have a very short set of processes, just a few millimeters, into the olfactory bulb. Now, even though these brains are very different and the, the territory covered by the olfactory bulb relatively is much smaller in humans, we in fact have the same olfactory system as a rat. All the connections are the same, many of the receptors are the same, and, um, and so the idea that we are really bad at smelling is in fact not true. Um, so, once you get into the brain, or past the sensory receptors, what we find, and this is a work from uh, Peter Mombert's lab, uh, that receptors in the epithelium, say in this cartoon, the red receptors expressing the red receptor, collect their axons and all project to an identified spot in the olfactory bulb that is specific to that, neurons expressing that receptor type. And here what you see is looking on the top view of two olfactory bulbs from a mouse, mouse that's been bred to have a gene that colors the neurons that express this receptor blue. And so you see these axons coming in right to this single spot. And the spots that these um, axons hit are called glomeruli. And um, I'll get to those more in a minute, but if you do various methods of imaging the activity of this bulb, then you can show that um, a given odor produces a very complex but identifiable pattern in the olfactory bulb. So this is um, basically it's the, the outer surface of the olfactory bulb unrolled and this map tells you how active these different parts of the cortical surface are as sensory stimuli come in for a given odor. Um, this is for one heptanol, which is a, a, an alcohol, seven carbon alcohol with a, the alcohol group on the first carbon. And so um, and what we find is that, um, that these patterns are identifiable from odor to odor. But the odors themselves are also complex. 
Most natural odors are composed of tens to hundreds of different types of molecules in various ratios. And even odors composed of a single type of molecule produce these very complex maps. So these are highly fragmented. The fragmentation resembles a space of much higher dimensions, probably on the order of tens or hundreds, projected onto the two-dimensional sheet of cortex in the olfactory bulb. If we look at the input patterns across different odors, we find that even though they're fragmented, they can predict the perceptual differences between odors. So here what you see are these uh, activation patterns for in response to different um, alcohols that just differ by moving the alcohol group across the chain of the alcohol. And if you look at these patterns, they systematically change from one to the next to the next. And as you get further away in chemical space, the patterns get more different. And the similarity of these input patterns predicts how similar odors smell. So it looks like we're in pretty good shape. Um, within this very complex input space though, we can find neurons in the olfactory bulb that respond to a given molecule and appear to represent some ranges around chemical features. But before I show you this, I need to explain a little bit of anatomy. This being a St. John's audience, I need to show something historical. This is from Ramoni Cajal, who won with um, Golgi the Nobel Prize in 1905, I think, um, for their work on staining and drawing um, the first diagrams of neurons. What you see here are these glomeruli. The glomeruli are spherical structures at the periphery of the olfactory bulb, and they contain the receiving apparatus of the neurons within the olfactory bulb. Here we're looking at the bottom of the olfactory bulb, sort of cross section. And these neurons are called mitral cells, and they are, their cell bodies are here, and then they have these long dendrites or receiving ends that receive the sensory nerve input. There are a lot of um, other neurons here, and these are uh, granule cell neurons, which are local and inhibitory to these mitral cells. The mitral cells send projections or axons out to many, many parts of the brain. Oops. So when we want to record from these neurons, what we do is we take the olfactory bulb and we uh, put a wire in and we can record the voltage signal. And depending on how we set the filters on our amplifier, we can record the activity of single neurons, these are called spikes, um, because these neurons produce very fast discharges of electrical potential, which we can measure. Or if we put a big electrode and change our filters, then we can record much lower frequency activity, which is the summed activity of lots and lots of neurons in the local neighborhood. Um, so recording single neurons allows us to see how these individual neurons respond to the signals coming in from the environment. In anesthetized animals, we can get quite stable recordings that represent the stimulus in some understandable dimensions. This neuron uh, recorded in the olfactory bulb right here uh, responds maximally to an ester, uh, an ethyl ester that's four carbon, that's on the fourth carbon. Um, and if we look across this whole set, what we see is it fires the most to the E4 and then a little bit on each side. So this looks like what's called a receptive field. My own studies and others have shown that about 10% of olfactory bulb principal neurons or mitral cells respond to any given odor. And neurons that will respond to any given odor can be white, well, quite widely distributed in the olfactory bulb. So let's assume for now that there is a code and that it's distributed across the population of neurons that receive the sensory input. That means that possibly thousands of cells respond to any given odor and represent that odor by their collective responses. So it might seem that we have a representation of objective sensory objects. And this corresponds to chemical structure. We know that a given odor produces a given stable input pattern at the first stage of cortical processing. We assume then that the brain 
applies filters and adds meaning and eventually results in behavior. This is where we would be wrong. The olfactory bulb neurons send output to all parts of the olfactory system and many parts of the limbic system, which is involved, the limbic system is involved in memory and emotion, um, spatial cognition. But the part of the story we neglect to tell our students is that the olfactory bulb gets more input from the brain than it does from the receptors, okay? A lot more. Um, every layer of the olfactory bulb receives inputs from other parts of the brain. Each one of these neurons in the olfactory bulb is bathed in the sea of neuromodulators from the brainstem, synapses from nearby and far away neurons, and the individual's experiences which have modified and shaped these connections. Work I did as a postdoctoral scholar at Caltech showed that each neuron in fact responds very strongly to what the animal is doing more than what the animal is smelling. However, these are, these are the neurons, one synapse from your nose, okay? However, there are many neurons that respond to a given odor in different ways. And a neuroscientist can tell which among a small group of odors was presented to the animal by surveying enough of these cells and comparing their patterns across the small group of stimuli. We assume that if we can decipher the stimulus from the neuronal firing patterns, that this is an objective representation of the odor. However, if we do something simple, like ask the animal to associate that odor with something else, the represent representation of this odor is changed quickly and dramatically. And all the representations are changed. Every cell that responds to an odor in one condition changes its response in another condition, meaning that the individual neurons do not respond to the sensory input consistently or objectively. This means that at the very first synapse in the cerebral cortex, we do not have objective olfactory signals as input from the environment. There is no objective code. Perhaps we just have to be more clever about the code Firing rate is only one way in which neurons change their responses to stimuli. They also change the ways in which they associate with other neurons. And this association can affect the fidelity of the signal received by other brain regions. This is the lens with which I focus the work in my laboratory. The general principle is that when a bunch of neurons get wired up together with reciprocal excitation and inhibition, oscillations ine inevitably arise as the neurons interact within their normal parameter ranges. The olfactory system of mammals produces an extraordinary array of beautiful neural oscillations. And one of these is arguably the best studied oscillation in the mammalian brain and perhaps in any type of brain. So in 1942, Lord Adrian published the first characterization of an olfactory bulb odor evoked fast oscillation. And here it is. This is actually from a later paper, but um, still by him. There he sat in his laboratory with a hedgehog, an insulated silver wire and an amplifier, and saw what we now call a gamma oscillation evoked by common laboratory odors. One of those odors, those common laboratory odors was cigarette smoke. So you can imagine them all, the physiologists just bending over their rigs, <sighs> blowing smoke on everything. We can't do that now. Now we have much more complicated instruments, but the brains have not really changed that much. And we see similar oscillations in anesthetized and waking animals, including rats and mice and even insects, which have olfactory systems similar to mammals, but evolved completely separately. We also have the advantage of advances in digital computers and statistical methods, so we can better quantify these oscillatory phenomena. Parallel advances in instrumentation, materials, and pharmacology have helped us all to go deeper into the circuit and, proper, and the properties of individual neurons. All of this allows me to say that a single type of synapse creates the olfactory bulb gamma oscillation. This, this is a mitral cell that receives sensory input here and has these uh, what are called lateral dendrites that synapse with granule cells. This is a very special synapse, synapse between dendrites, which is not the canonical picture of synapses. And they 
do this reciprocal excitation and inhibition, which results in an oscillation. One cell gets excited, excites the other cell, which inhibits that cell, which stops this cell from exciting that cell, which stops the cell from inhibiting that cell, and starts all over. That's what runs this oscillation. And we can tell the precision of firing of the population by looking at how big the gamma oscillation is. This, this is actually the, what's called the probability of any individual cell firing at any given time relative to the voltage. So the pro as the, this voltage gets bigger, the cell is more likely to fire. So what you see here are two sniffs in a waking rat. Um, the, these oscillations, these slow ones are the sniffs and these fast ones are the gamma oscillations. They start at the end of inhalation with the transition to exhalation and the, how big they are tells you how nicely tuned and cooperating the underlying neural population is. But even this synapse is not a static thing. There are hundreds of thousands of them in an olfactory bulb. The local field oscillation with which we measure them represents the cooperative activity of 10 to 100,000 cells in the neighborhood of the electrode. Those that are not participating in the group activity get washed out by what is essentially averaging by the electrode. So the local field potential is really a measure of coherent or cooperative activity in large numbers of cells. So what do oscillations do for a neural circuit? They're really pretty and we like them, um, but what do they do? One thing that they do is to coordinate the firing of neurons into small, compact time windows that are predictable to downstream neurons. This way a small group of cooperating neurons can drive other neurons precisely and the downstream neurons are sensitive to collecting input in about a 10 millisecond time window. Oscillations may also help areas of the brain share processing when these areas share the same coherent rhythm. This is usually at lower frequencies um, like this slow oscillation. This oscillation in waking rats is about, this one is about four hertz, uh, four cycles per second. When they sniff something really excitedly when they're trying to discriminate odors, it's more about eight to 10 hertz. Um, and these oscillations are about 70 hertz. So within and across olfactory areas, the degree of cooperativity between neurons is manipulated on this time scale of a single sniff or even a part of a sniff and depends very much on the context. Here's our parts of a sniff. The brain changes state every 100 milliseconds or so and can change global states in the span of an eye blink. So here's an example of a rat doing two really complex behaviors. One, he's exploring the cage, sniffing all the goodies that are in there, usually rat poop. Um, and here he is just turned around and sniffing at a little hole in the wall where his water bottle usually is at the air outside the cage. If we look at the activity in the olfactory bulb during this time, here's his respiratory signal. We see that in going from a respiratory speed of about six to 10 hertz down to about five hertz, four or five hertz, the state of the brain changes dramatically from one sniff to the next as he goes from exploring to poking, to sniffing at the outside air. So we take these, this, this information and we can find out a lot about how the brain is working. So here's what we've found over the past 15 years or so. Um, we're gonna start with a schematic. Just here's our receptor neurons coming from the nose. Ignore this part. These are interesting, but networks around the glomeruli. Here's our mitral cells, here's our granule cells. Excitatory, inhibitory, onto each other. And there's, here's all the feedback um, that's coming back to the system. If we simply cut this feedback temporarily, you can inject lidocaine or put a cooling probe there or even cut it with a scalpel. What happens is, and here's the control condition, here's the sniff associated oscillation taken out of here. If you cool it down, cool down the peduncle or the rear of the olfactory bulb to prevent this from coming in but leave the forward pathway intact, gamma oscillations get much bigger. 
So the idea is that this input from the center of the brain, or what's called centrifugal input, desynchronizes the population and allows it to much more subtly um, do stuff. Okay, I told you the insect system was very much like ours. Here's the mammalian system, here's the insect system. The receptor neurons come in and synapse onto both sets of neurons and they don't have this glomerular cell network. They just have balls of neuropil. Um, they also make odor evoked oscillations. If you put an odor on the antenna of a honeybee or a locust, um, what you get evoked is this oscillation. And here's a, an example of the way one neuron is firing during one of these oscillations. If you put on a drug called picrotoxin, which blocks all the inhibition in this circuit, leaves all the excitation intact, what happens is the oscillations go away, the slow temporal firing patterns um, are, are unchanged, but the, but the cooperativity between the cells is gone. And this is work that was done not by myself, but in the lab where I was a postdoc. Um, the interesting thing is that honeybees, to which you do this, can still tell the difference between odors that are very different from each other. They can't tell the difference between odors that are very similar. So this, the, the idea here, um, which matched a lot of computational theory at the time, was that um, these oscillations help with what's called fine odor discrimination. Now, a, a project that we did that looked at the opposite manipulation, this is from mice. So we're a knockout mouse where these cells lost their uh, receptors that allowed them to be inhibited. Everything else is the same. What happens in these mice is that they have massively increased gamma oscillations, suggesting that this inhibitory drive to these neurons desynchronizes the population. And these mice are better than normal. Here's the normal mice generalized, here's the odor they're trained on, they generalize to odors that are nearby, these guys don't. So they're better at discriminating, but worse at generalizing. So my graduate student, um, Jen Beschel, did an experiment where she wanted to test, these were really severe manipulations to the system. She wanted to test whether rats would modulate this on their own, it, depending on what they needed to discriminate. So she trained rats to discriminate um, lots of different odor sets, and here's two of them, either butanol and octanol, which we called coarse, and, or hexanol and heptanol, which we called fine, because there were only one carbon difference. Um, and the hypothesis was that fine discrimination tasks should require more precision and show larger gamma power. And that's exactly what she found. Here what you see is a couple of seconds of data from an olfactory bulb, of one of these rats, here's, and here's the piriform cortex, which is one of the next cortical areas. Um, this is during coarse discrimination. The animal nose pokes here, which starts the odor, and here's where the odor is presented. Um, and here, um, the animal does the same thing, only it's in the context of doing a fine odor discrimination. And what she sees is basically this. So these animals are ramping up the amount of synchrony or cooperativity within this network to solve the problem. And this is just the quantitative analysis of that, looking at the power in, these ba in this band for fine odor versus coarse odor discrimination. So what this means is that gamma oscillations rely on local circuits. If you take out input from other areas, they go away. They don't show matched or coherent oscillations in the nearby cortical areas. Um, they're modulated by central activity. They support precise discrimination of similar patterns by coordinating large numbers of cells when necessary. Now, so something funny happened. At the same time, Claire Martin did her uh, PhD thesis in, in Lyon in France and then came to my lab as a postdoc. And her PhD thesis showed that animals made or rats made what we call beta oscillations, which are much lower frequency um, when rats are, are learning to discriminate odors. And when they get good at it, these oscillations get bigger. 
she came to my lab and the rats started making beta oscillations. And we were perplexed, right? And these oscillations are coherent throughout the entire olfactory system and any other connected structure we've recorded to date. So first we thought, well, Claire's speaking French to her rats and Jen is speaking English to her rats, so we made them swap. Didn't work. Right, that would have been a nice solution. Um, so the other thing about beta oscillations is contrary to gamma, so here's beta oscillations in the olfactory bulb and piriform cortex from Claire's thesis work. Um, showing that they're nicely coherent there when animals are really good at doing this discrimination. If you cut out the feedback to, to the olfactory bulb, you get big gamma oscillations as we saw before, but you lose the beta oscillations. So beta oscillations engage the entire system. They're about 20 hertz. They represent the only band with significant and reliable coherence among distributed brain regions and not just for olfaction, but other systems as well. They depend on central inputs to the olfactory bulb and they're enhanced with learning um, inf and information from other laboratories and computational modeling in my own lab suggests that the same reciprocal synapse that produces gamma oscillations operates in a different mode to produce beta oscillations. So both sets of rats had learned to discriminate the odors equally in the same lab, in the same behavior box with the same odors. They sniffed the same odors. They made very similar responses. We got really different results. This led us on a five-year journey to try to understand what might produce such a difference. In the end, the answer is in general terms what we believed it would be in the beginning, but the details were quite different. We believed that it was the cognitive structure of the task we used to have the rats tell us what the odor smells like that drove the difference. The rats that made gamma oscillations did what's called a two alternative choice task, meaning choose one of two behavioral options, go left, go right, in response to an odor. The other task is called a go, no go task, meaning that there's one learned behavior, go left, and the other rat has, to, and the rat has to do it in response to one odor and refrain from doing it in response to the other. On the face of things, to a neurobiologist, these seem very similar but to a psychologist, which I play on television, they are very different. Go, no go tasks involve a heavily favored prepotent, prepotent response that must be inhibited when the no go odor is present. Two alternative choice tasks involve two learned behaviors that become associated with two different stimuli. Previously, everyone in the lab wrote training protocols themselves and there was a lot of human intervention in training. We thought that if we trained the rats in very similar ways and used a more automated approach in which the training diverged only at the end when the second odor was introduced, we would be able to replicate our previous results, gamma in two alternative choice and beta in, no go, in go, no go. And then we could figure out what the neural mechanisms that supported these two different cognitive modes were. As with most things in biology, what we found was not quite what we expected. We found that once we normalized our training protocols, the two groups looked very similar. So here's a data example from my student, uh, Donald Frederick. And now we're much better at, at getting the odor there very quickly. The animal does a nose poke here and the odor arrives in about 60 milliseconds. And you see these snips and you see these, these gamma bursts and you see beta bursts. Here's the olfactory bulb. Here's the piriform cortex. The, the signal is very coherent in the beta frequency band, not as much in the gamma. So we, we, there are clear differences in behavior also. Um, rats sniff one sniff longer in the go, no go task than the two alternative choice task. But there are modest differences in physiology. So here's at the end of training, with our two tasks, we see a little, this is a spectrogram. On the bottom is time up to uh, zero to half a second. And on the left is frequency. And the color tells you how strong the signal is. We see a lot of gamma activity in the go, no go task, less so in the two alternative choice, a little bit of beta in both. 
we give, we transfer them to new odor sets, that's where things get really interesting. Um, again, the tasks are different, just a matter of degree. We see gamma here, little gamma, and beta in both tasks. We can train the rats to um, do really complex odor discrimination. This is what we call the extreme discrimination. We take the same odor in two different bottles and we open them in two different rooms for three hours. That means there are different trace contaminants in these two bottles. And what we see when we do that is that we recapitulate the gamma results from before. So here the rats um, make a lot of gamma, big gamma oscillations, no beta. And so what this shows is that when the task is really hard and the way we were having the rats do the task before was much harder than it needed to be. They ramp up gamma um, to overcome the inability to discriminate. Um, so we can also map these phenomena back onto our earlier studies. So here's our earlier study. Remember I said we were not very good at getting the odor there fast. It took about half a second. And here what you see, an animal sniffing wildly, waiting for the odor to come. The odor comes, the signal is upside down because we're just recording on the other side of a dipole field. Um, we see a few sniffs and we see a big beta oscillation. So um, what we find is that gamma oscillations occur on the first one to three sniffs after the odor gets to the rat. These are also the sniffs that rats adjust when looking for odors of certain physical properties in a mixture. So this uh, was a study that we uh, did to test the hypothesis that rats would change the airflow in the nose to target either high or low solubility odorants. The reason we suspected this is that because odors have a quality, uh, chemicals have a quality of solubility or sorptiveness that says how, how well they will absorb into the mucus that is on top of the um, odor receptors and get to the receptors. And if it's low solubility, you have to leave it there longer to get it into the receptors. If it's high solubility, if you sniff really fast, um, only the high solubility components will get there and they'll filter out the rest of the mixture. So what we found, or what my graduate student Daniel found, was that rats increase the speed of these sniffs, the speed of flow of the first two sniffs when they, uh, when they are sniffing these odors. Look, the same odors looking for different targets. So we also know if the rat sniffs for only the first couple of sniffs, he's still above chance in responding. So here's the odor arriving. What you see here is the probability of being correct for our two tasks and for how long the animals are sampling. If they sample for 250 milliseconds, they're above chance for both tasks. If they sample longer, and these are the um, distributions of when they stop sampling for our two tasks, um, they do better, okay? During this time, a lot of things are going on. During this extra time, here's our 250 milliseconds. Here's zero. Here's when the odor gets there. Here's what these are, are histograms of the gamma, two types of gamma, don't worry about that right now, and, um, and beta events that are happening over hundreds of thousands of trials across eight animals. And what you see here is that these are so stereotyped that in fact, if we just collect the bursts, we get back the sniffs. So these animals are sniffing in such a stereotyped fashion for these first couple of sniffs that we can recover those sniffs. They sniff one, two, maybe three, and then the beta os oscillations start. So it's during this extra time that they're sniffing that the beta oscillation comes on and they do better. We don't know if um, this is actually causing them to do better, the oscillation, or if they're doing better causes the beta oscillation. We know they're linked to the rat's exit from the odor port or the initiation of the behavior or the anticipation of reward outcome or their certainty. We don't know which of those things yet, but we're working on that. We're also working hard on the circuit mechanisms involved in the beta oscillation. What we suspect 
is that the rat's mindset is determined by the task and that a stereotype series of brief cortical and neuromodulatory events in higher order areas adjust the more peripheral olfactory bulb circuit very quickly to process the odors and initiate a response in a certain context. Given that the time course of these stereotyped events is consistent across different types of experiments, we believe we have identified a set of neurocognitive primitives in the system. And the strength of these events is modified depending on how we've trained the rats. So what do we know about how the brain processes odors? We know that for the tasks we have examined, gamma and beta states occur in sequence. So we infer that with the first two sniffs in the olfactory bulb, neurons receive sensory input and use neuromodulatory and other signals from other parts of the brain to create local os oscillatory assemblies of neurons in response to the rat's odor sampling. At this point, if the rat stops sampling the odor, he'll be able to make a response that is okay. However, the rat usually continues sampling and beta oscillations occur, indicating that there, there is a cooperative state across many brain regions. If the rat samples long enough for this to happen, he's much more likely to produce the correct response. We're a little bit closer to understanding the sequence and types of neural events that describe this behavior. And for gamma oscillations, at least, we also understand the functional role of these events. The fact that different types of tasks and training protocols give us different answers just reinforces the fact that this very peripheral sensory area is under extreme central control. Once again, while we see that there are some general rules about how the system works and how it is modulated, the early signals and the ways in which neurons cooperate are determined in large part by ongoing internal brain states. How the neurons are cooperating with each other is determined not only by the stimulus, but also by the individual's goal and prior experience when, encountered, when encountering the stimulus. This means, once again, that there is not likely to be any objective code once the stimulus hits the brain. So let's get back to the issue of how neuroscientists study brains. I took a hard line at the beginning and in the title that there's no objective neural code. In its pure state, this is false. Firing of neurons might tell us, as observers, exactly what those neurons are doing and what signal they got from both the periphery and the brain. If we had enough data from enough neurons um, and brain areas, we might be able to know at any instant what the animal is doing or perceiving. But this is not really what we mean when we talk about neural codes and sensory systems. What we mean is that the code is the key to how that type of neuron or that brain area represents and processes features of the objective information that is received from the sensory world. What I maintain is that this objective information is not received in the brain. It may not even be received by the sensory receptors. I showed you a case where rats change the way that they sniff odors depending on the type of odor they're looking for. The same happens for vision, touch, hearing, and taste. I hope I convinced you of this in the olfactory system. You'll just have to take my word for it that the olfactory system is not just super complicated or a special case. This context dependence and neural processing happens everywhere in brains as individuals navigate through a world that changes with every breath. As Heraclitus noted, one cannot step twice in the same river. If we do not have an objective picture of the world, what do we have? Would I go so far as Hume did and say that we have no knowledge of the real world? We, we do have knowledge. We have reliable sets of relationships and interactions of thing, with things in the world. Reliable in the sense that you and I agree that red is red, that hardness is a property of solids, and that a rose produces rose scent. The experience and representation of these things we reconstruct every time we encounter stimuli in the world and we create the sense or feeling of objectivity, of perceptual constancy, even when the neurons tell us that the sensory signal is anything but objective or constant. When a rat seeks an odor in a complex mixture of things, it mobilizes all the synapses changed by learning, the expectations from the task, changing neuromodulators, and higher order activity impinging on the olfactory bulb. The sensory stimulus comes in, 
and the olfactory bulb enters a state which to the rat supports the experience of that odor in the context of doing the task we have assigned. This state is supported by coordinated dynamics within the olfactory bulb and with the rest of the brain. In connection with respiratory circuits in the brainstem, airflow in the nose and the state of receptors in the epithelium. The rat enters a state of recognition, which includes its behavioral response. We find that the rat with practice matches the correct response to the stimulus most of the time. In our experiments, we catch glimpses of the neural system as it produces these states and percepts. We get better pictures with more electrodes, more brain sites, and analyses that report dynamics and relationships between brain areas. When we look at the data in this framework, it gives us a stable picture of perception and the world, but not the kind of stability we imagined. What I propose is that we stop thinking of brains as information gathering devices. They certainly can do that, but rather as devices that allow individuals to navigate the world actually and metaphorically. We don't need objective representations to do this, just reliable interactions between brains and contexts. Would I go as far as Watson and other behaviorists to claim that all we can know is that the stimulus predicts the response? One reason I wouldn't claim that is that the behaviorists would likely not acknowledge that we can understand the internal de novo construction of cognitive states that can drive perception and responses. The other reason is that I don't believe that there is no understandable relationship between the object and the percept. And this is where emergent processes come in. An emergent process is one that gives rise to something different after lower, lower level processes or parts are combined. This is not a new concept. We know from decades of works, work in physics that dynamic processes can define states and that the details that support those states are not the same every time those states emerge. This is also not new to neuroscience or even to my own work, but the mounting information is making the neural coding hypotheses less and less tenable. If we think of perception in this way, then the experience of interacting with a smell, sniffing it, sensing it, associating it with other things, creates a state or process that engages the neural system, the individual, the environment, the stimulus, the body, all these things in what emerges as, the, as a percept. The constancy that is then created is in the interaction of the presumed objective chemical composition of the odor, a human or rat or insect nervous system and physical loss. Experience, behavior, time, individual history and context add to the mix and all of these factors are what we observe in neurons and brains. We catch a glimpse of this emergence and should find a way to describe it in its full beauty instead of, instead of stripping away everything but the stimulus. <laughs>